All right, good morning, everybody. Hope you've had a good week. And a couple announcements here. Looks like everything's good to go. Um, just want to point out, in addition to YouTube and Facebook, I'm also live streaming on Sermon Audio at the moment. And my content is also being archived now on SermonAudio.com. So you can go to SermonAudio.com, type in Matt Crane in the search bar, and you'll find the material there. I'm uploading some of my older sermons to there as well, and the older videos. It'll just take time to get the previous videos put onto there, but all the new stuff is going to be archived there. So if for some reason I just don't show up one Sunday <laughs> on YouTube, uh, you'll be able to find it there, sermonaudio.com, and you can also watch it live through through that website as well. Um, I'm going to be shortening these lessons, which as I mentioned last week, I think will be better for the online watching. And also it enables me to have a little bit more time in the week to not have to spend so much time preparing for a lesson and uh, be able to use some of that time towards uh, writing books and putting uh, publishing some of the things that I believe the Lord has you know, revealed to me through my studies over the years, uh, working on Time of the End Part 2, and I've uh, been making good progress on that, finally, now that I've, I've shortened these sermon lessons for Sunday, these, these Bible studies, so uh, making good progress there. And then uh, also, I'd encourage you to share these videos with your friends or family or other people that you know that might get a blessing from these things, or maybe you see a video that really helps explain something to you that you've wondered about for a long time. And uh, if you know other people that are asking the same questions, you know, send the link to them, and uh, hopefully the video will be a blessing to them. I've got links in the bottom of the YouTube live stream. So if you want to pick up one of the books or, you know, find the sermon audio page or find Final Fight Bible Radio or check out Final Fight Bible Radio Premium, uh, you'll have the links at the bottom of there. And then, uh, yeah, so that should do it for the announcements uh, for this morning. So uh, this morning we're going to be going into part two on the three great days of prophecy. And uh, we're looking at the subject of the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, and the day of God, and what those things are in the Bible, what those events uh, represent, and the differences between those things. Last week I showed you the differences between those three days so that you could identify each one of them, and as the Bible says, rightly divide each day, so that you know the day of Christ and the day of the Lord and the day of God are not necessarily are not the same thing. There's, there's different events that take place at each one of those. And as the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, we're supposed to study that we can show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right. So as I showed you before, the day of Christ has to do with the rapture of the church uh, before the tribulation. And it has to do with the judgment seat of Christ in the verses that we looked at last week, the five times that it shows up in the New Testament. All right, the day of the Lord has to do with the second advent of Jesus Christ. And this is different from the rapture in that at the day of the Lord, Jesus Christ comes back down onto the ground. You'll remember in Zechariah, his foot touches Mount Olivet. That's the first time Jesus' foot has touched the ground since he ascended, you know, back there in uh, Matthew chapter 28. And uh, the first time Jesus' foot touches the ground is there on Mount Olivet, and the mountain breaks in half, and Jesus Christ is back down on the earth to rule and reign as king from Jerusalem over all the kingdoms of the earth, and his reign is going to be a thousand years long, according to Revelation chapter 20. All right, at the day of the Lord, at the return of Jesus Christ, you have the Battle of Armageddon, and that's the battle of Jesus Christ and his armies versus the Antichrist and his armies, and it's pretty much the most epic event uh, in all of history, <laughs> and that's why the Bible has more to say about this event than just about any other thing in the scriptures. All right, and then you get to the day of God, and uh, that day doesn't have, there's not a lot of information in the Bible about that. However, uh, we are told a few things. Ezekiel chapter 38 records the battle of what we call the battle of Gog and Magog. Uh, Jesus has been ruling and reigning for a thousand years, and the nations of the world come against Jerusalem and against Jesus, and at that time, fire falls from heaven, burns up uh, the armies of Satan again, <laughs> and, but at that time, the universe explodes, the heaven and earth flee away, and then you have the great white throne judgment, and then after that, God creates a new heaven and a new earth, and you read about that in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. So, today I want to show you the similarities okay, between these events, and I believe as we start to see the similarities, you're going to start to see a pattern that will begin to develop. And once we begin to recognize a pattern between these three events, uh, what will happen is we'll be able to start taking some 
educated guesses on some of the aspects of prophecy that are a little bit murky. Because the way a pattern works, if you see that the thing repeats itself over and over and over, if you have a gap in your pattern, you can take a pretty good guess as to what goes in the gap by looking at the other part, parts of the pattern. And I'm going to show you how that works. You find that that actually shows up a lot throughout the Bible. That's a good way of uh, Bible understanding and Bible interpretation is to look at patterns. And we'll be looking at a little bit of that as we go. At the very least, I think this lesson will give you some things to think about. So let's start with the most basic similarity here. And this one kind of goes without saying. But you have the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, and the day of God. And what we're dealing with here is uh, deity. All right? So Christ, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, day of God. Uh, those are three separate days, but these are not three separate deities. All right? That's, that's kind of obvious. Uh, Jesus Christ is the Lord, right? And Jesus Christ is God, right? So it's not three separate gods with three separate days. It's the same God, obviously. Jesus Christ is the Lord. Jesus Christ is God, and uh, let me get ahead of myself here. So technically, technically, a person would not be wrong if they called all three of, of these events the same thing. Let's just say, hypothetically speaking, if everybody wanted to say this is the day of Christ, uh, this is the day of Christ, and this is the day of Christ, I mean, in a way, technically they'd be right because Jesus Christ is the Lord and Jesus Christ is God. So you could give all three things the same title, and uh, but the thing is, the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures has used different terminology. Even though Christ, Lord, and God are all synonymous, the Holy Spirit has given us different terminology for these three days so that we can distinguish the events. Because, admittedly, it would be kind of hard if all three of those events were labeled the same thing, but were meant to be different events. You see what I mean? See, if you tried to make all three events the same, under the same title, like the New Bibles do, as I pointed out in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, you lose the ability to distinguish which event the Holy Spirit is referring to in the passage, and you end up getting all three events jumbled together, and consequently you end up getting your doctrine all screwed up. As I pointed out last week, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the New Bibles change the day of Christ to the day of the Lord. They use that different terminology. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in the New Bibles is still referring to this event, if you know your Bible, if you know, if you know the context. However, to the average layman, if you remove that with the day of the Lord and you change that title, it's no wonder that so many Christians say, I mean, you think about the majority of Christianity, the majority of the church, the majority of Christians don't use a King James Bible. The majority of Christians use NIVs, NASBs, ESVs, ASVs, RVs. They use all these different Bible versions, and all of them change the day of Christ to the day of the Lord. And so when a, new, when a Christian is going along and doesn't understand the Bible issue, and they come across 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and it says that uh, you know the day of the Lord shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin will be revealed well they read day of the Lord and then they cross reference that with Joel chapter 2 and Isaiah chapter 10 and Isaiah chapter 11 Isaiah chapter 13 Zechariah 14 and Matthew 24 and they and no wonder Christians think that they're going to go through the great tribulation as a matter of fact there's a lot of Christians that think we're, we're in the beginning of sorrows right now there are some Christians that think the mark of the beast has already come and we're in the great tribulation and we're waiting for the day of the Lord now as a King James Bible believer, you might scoff at some of that and say, oh, that's so pathetic, that's so dumb, why would anybody think that? Well, don't be so arrogant, because the fact of the matter is, a lot of people, like I said, they just don't understand that there's a Bible issue. They, they perfect, they're, they're under the, the assumption that the Bible they have is a good, reliable translation, because that's what they've been told, and that it's just easier to understand. But the fact of the matter is, uh, the words have been changed. And uh, the fact of the matter is, um, it may very well be that some of these new Bibles are easier to read, as they say. Granted, there's some words in the King James Bible that are hard to understand. But let's, let's just face it, what good is an easy read if you're reading the wrong information? Right? I'd rather have the right information and the right words and have to get a dictionary out once in a while and use my brain uh, rather than having the wrong information and the wrong words that are going to lead me into wrong doctrine. You see that? You don't dumb down the Bible to match your level of, of uh, intellect. 
right? That's what they're doing in the school system. They dumb down the school system so it can be easier for the children. <laughs> well, maybe you should keep a high level of academics and encourage the children to educate themselves and just get smarter. Well, the same thing goes with the Bible. Oh, the King James Bible is so hard to read. It has the old Elizabeth in English. All right, well, that was the pinnacle of the English language. Why not learn something? Why not get a dictionary out once in a while and actually increase your intellect and, and, can, and not change God's words? You see, it's either change God's words or change your intellect. And uh, the better thing to do is just to raise your, your, your level of intellect and... Uh, stick with the Word of God. Anyway, that's another subject. I'm getting off track. So the day of Christ, day of God, day of uh, the Lord, we have deity, deity, deity. Okay, simple pattern right there. All right, the next thing I want to compare is the appearances, the appearances, appearances of Jesus Christ at these days. Now we know at the day of Christ there's going to be an appearance of Jesus Christ. We have that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And at this appearance, Jesus Christ evidently only appears to the church. All right? That's the moment when the trumpet sounds and the dead are raised, uh, the dead Christians are raised up, and then those of us which are alive and remain are caught up together into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. There's no indication whatsoever that the world sees Jesus at this time. There's no indication whatsoever that Jews see Jesus at this time, unless perhaps there's a type with Saul of Tarsus seeing the Lord in his return, and maybe the 144,000 see Jesus, and they become converted at that time. There's a possibility maybe there, but for the most part, there's no indication that the world sees Jesus at this time. As a matter of fact, when it comes to the unbelievers, when it comes to the uh, unbelieving Jews, Jesus said, "Ye shall not see me." In Matthew chapter 23, "Ye shall," uh, when he said, "Your house is left unto desolate," he said, "For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord." All right. Well, the Jews aren't saying, "Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord" right here, but they will after the great tribulation, three and a half years of being persecuted persecuted and hunted down by the Antichrist, they're going to be crying out to God for salvation. And when Jesus returns and they see him coming in power and great glory, they're going to say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, because Jesus Christ is coming to bring salvation. All right. Now, I, appear, I apologize for the kind of lame paper here, but it kind of eliminated that glare. So we're just going to go with it. All right. So you have an appearance of Jesus Christ at the day of the Lord. Appearance here and appearance here, except the appearance here is to the world. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible says, Every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. All right, so he appears to the whole world. Everybody at that time, not the whole world without exception necessarily, but the whole world without distinction. Uh, all the nations of the world are gathered together against Jerusalem, and when Jesus Christ comes down out of the clouds and with his armies, the whole everybody sees him. All, all the races of mankind see him. Some people try to use that verse as a proof text for a flat earth. You know, you got to have a flat earth so that way everybody on the earth can see Jesus at the same time when he comes, whereas you couldn't do that with a spherical earth. That's, uh, I, 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 in my opinion, that's kind of a lame argument for a flat earth. The fact of the matter is you can just as easily have Jesus Christ, every eye shall see him, meaning not every eye without exception, but every eye without distinction. And you have that show up in the Bible at different times too, that concept. Anyway, uh, so the day of the Lord, he appears to uh, saved, well, he appears to the people at the end of the Great Tribulation, whether they're believing on Him or not believing on Him, the whole world sees Him. And that's different from this, this event. At the day of the rapture, the whole world doesn't see Him. It's just His church. All right. So He appears to the world. He's open. He's open and, and uh, visible to everybody. Okay. And then at the day of God, uh, we have another appearance of Jesus Christ, except uh, basically He appears to, we'll just say, the universe universe. Now this one's kind of weird, um, admittedly, when you try to when you think about it and think about the details, because the fact of the matter is, by the time you get to this event, the Bible says that uh, uh, in Revelation chapter 20, the fire of, of God falls down from heaven, and then the heavens and the, and the heavens and the earth flee away from the face from the face of him that sits on the throne. Well, for a thousand years, Jesus has been sitting on a throne. He's been sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, okay? The throne of David. 
He's been sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem, and the whole world's been able to see him and actually go and visit him and pay homage to him. But here it says the whole universe flees away from the face of him that sits on the throne. So we tend to think, well, that's a reference to God the Father. All right, Jesus Christ is down on the earth, and then uh, God the Father shows his face to the creation, and all the creation explodes. Okay, that's kind of the mentality behind it. But and then and then the one sitting on the throne, God the Father, judges all the nations at the great white throne judgment. The only thing, the only problem with that that you should maybe think about, and I don't have all the answers for all this, but the Bible said that God the Father has committed all judgment unto the Son. All right, so that implies that Jesus Christ is the one sitting on the great white throne there in Revelation chapter 20. And he's the one that's going to be judging uh, death and, and, and hell and all the dead that are, that are brought before him. Because God the Father has committed all judgment unto the Son. So it's like, well, how does that work? If Jesus was on the earth... For a thousand years, the earth and the heaven didn't flee away from his face at that time. Why would it flee away from his face at this time? I'm not exactly sure, other than it seems like in the Bible, there's God has an ability to, Jesus has an ability to uh, control the level, the brightness of his glory at different times. Uh, the Lord told Moses there on uh, Mount Sinai, no man can see my face and live. Well, obviously people saw Jesus' face when he was a man. You say, oh, well, he was in a veil of human flesh. Well, yes, that's true. But also when he rose from the dead. Okay, people saw his face. And uh, the, the image of Jesus, the imagery of Jesus, what people saw when, when uh, Jesus was making the fish there on the fire, remember? And Peter and the disciples were fishing. And they say, oh, it's the Lord. And they come and have a feast with him there in, in John chapter 21. Uh, and even when he, had, when he uh, was walking on the road to Emmaus with the disciples. And then when he shows up in Revelation chapter 1, he's showing up as his feet, his, his eyes are as a flame of fire, his, his face is like the sun. Well, that's not what they saw in Luke 23 and John chapter 21. So what's going on? It's like the Lord is able to control the dimness <laughs> of his glory in a way, and I don't doubt when he reigns on, on the earth in the millennium, he's going to be very glorious and very bright and shining, I would imagine. But evidently, there's still a level that he hasn't revealed yet, and when he reveals his full glory... The glory that he had with the Father before the world was, that he says in John 17, when he unveils his full glory, that's when the heavens and the earth explode, and then Jesus is the one sitting on that great white throne judging the universe. You can take that or leave that. I'm not exactly sure if that's how it all works, but uh, it's interesting to think about. So we see this pattern. Deity, 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 appearances to the church, appearance to the world, appearance to the universe. All right, the next uh, pattern that we see is uh, that of a great noise. All right, so over here, I'm just going to put a great noise. Now, the Bible doesn't necessarily say that there's a great noise at this time because we don't read much about this event other than in Revelation 20 and 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, but I would imagine that the universe blowing to pieces probably is accompanied with a great noise, all right? I'm just going to go out on, on a limb there <laughs> and think that that's probably not a quiet event, not a silent event. It's probably a great noise, all right? Now, we do know for a fact that the day of the Lord, uh, there is a great noise associated with that because the Bible says in 2 Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now, you remember that I pointed out in the last lesson that that sounds a lot like this, but it's, it's a reference to the day of the Lord, okay? So they're similar. There's a great noise here. This, the, el the, the elements in the sense of the entire universe is burned up. Uh, all of the elements are burned up, whereas at the day of the Lord, it appears that some of the elements are burned up. There's a big explosion here. But there's also a big explosion here, but it's not, not the same, okay? The heavens and the earth don't flee away at the, at the second advent. Otherwise, if all the universe exploded, he doesn't have a Jerusalem to reign from, okay? So there's, there's similarities. There's a great noise here. There's a great noise here. Is there a great noise at the day of Christ? Hmm. We would think if this pattern is consistent, there should be. And uh, the fact of the matter is, there is a great noise. The Bible says uh, there's going to be a noise that's so loud it's going to raise the dead, right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16, the Bible says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, which implies a loud sound, a great noise, 
I'm just saying great noise. We could say loud sound, whatever. But uh, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and uh, the dead in Christ shall rise first. All right, now that's the voice of God saying, come up hither. Right, the voice of Jesus saying, come up hither. And you get that in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. But uh, to God's people at the, at the day of Christ, that great noise, that sound of a trumpet, that's going to be crisp and clear and audible. Okay? It's going to be crisp and clear, just like a trumpet. The Bible likens it to. But to the unsaved, the unsaved world at this, at this moment, they might hear a noise, but uh, if they do, the Bible indicates that it's going to be the noise of thunder. It, it might sound like thunder. If In John chapter 12, when God the Father spoke from heaven uh, to spoke down from heaven about about his son Jesus, it says, the people therefore, he, he says, this is my beloved son, you know, I'm messing it up. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Now we got to look at it. All right. Uh, Jesus says, Father, glorify thy name. Then there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by heard it said that it thundered. Okay. And others said, an angel spake to him. All right, so a thunder is just a booming sound. It's not audible. You can't make out any particular uh, words. But then the other people say, no, I heard, I heard a voice. I heard an angel speaking. I heard words. And it said, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. See, there is a crowd of people there, and some people only heard one thing, and some people heard another. And the indication is those that were believing, the believers, they understood the voice of God. The words of God are spiritually discerned, right? We get that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So those people who were believing on Christ and knew the Lord, the, the indication is that they understood the voice of God, whereas everybody else just heard this booming sound and didn't understand uh, those words because they were spiritually discerned. So when Jesus Christ comes at the day of Christ at the rapture, there's going to be a sound of a great trumpet, and if you're saved, you'll, you'll hear, come up hither. But if you're unsaved... You just you might just hear this great loud booming sound in the sky, and then uh, everybody will be gone. <laughs> Not everybody, but the believers will be gone. All right, and then uh, so we have the we have the great noise. Now let's look at another parallel here: a resurrection. Let's think about a resurrection. All right. We know the day of Christ, the rapture, involves a resurrection. Obviously, it's going to be the dead in Christ are, ri are raised up, and then those that are alive and, and uh, remain uh, shall be caught up together with them in the air. There's going to be a resurrection. The new People that are alive at the coming of Christ are going to have their bodies changed. Uh, dead Christians are going to be raised from the dead and also have new bodies at that time. Um, the day of the Lord also involves a resurrection. All right, now I know a lot of you know this, and this is uh, repeat information for a lot of you, but don't worry, we're going to start getting into some of the deeper things as we go. We're just establishing this pattern here so that you can see the repeating things so that when we start having holes, we can start filling them in properly. All right, so there's going to be a resurrection at the day of the Lord. This is a resurrection essentially of dead Old Testament saints and dead righteous tribulation saints. So people that died or got martyred in the tribulation are raised from the dead at this time. Also, old people in the Old Testament that haven't been raised yet. When Jesus rose from the dead, the Bible says a lot of the bodies of the saints which slept arose and went into the city and appeared unto many for a short time. Uh, some Old Testament saints evidently have already risen uh, from the dead, but anybody that hasn't <laughs> is going to be resurrected at this time. And you have this described in Ezekiel chapter 37 with the valley of the dry bones. On all the bones, the, the ankle, foot bone is connected to the ankle bone, the ankle bone is connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bone is connected to the so on and so forth. Okay, and all, and all the sinews come on the people and you read about that thing in Ezekiel chapter 37. That's describing the resurrection that takes place at the day of the Lord. Jesus Christ comes back and then a bunch of people get raised from the dead. You have this in Job chapter 19, verse 25. Job was looking forward to this day. All right? Not this day. Not this day. He talked about this day. And bear in mind, Job is not even a Jew. I mean, he's not a child of a son of Abraham. And he's before the law. So that's interesting to think about. But Job chapter 19, verse 25, he says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. 
second advent. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. He says, after worms eat me up, I know that I'm going to see God, not in some ghostly, ethereal form. In my flesh, I'm going to see God when he stands on the earth. He was expecting a resurrection. And he was a righteous man, and he knew it. And so he knew that God would raise him from the dead someday. Now, these, these uh, righteous Old Testament saints, whether they're Jew or Gentile, are raised and live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And in Revelation chapter 20, this is called the first resurrection. You say, well, I thought this was the first resurrection. Well, this is considered the first, if you will, general resurrection. All right. So this is called, in Revelation 20, this is the first, quote, resurrection. The first resurrection, all right? If you, you can try to explain that if you want, why there's a resurrection here, and that one's called the first resurrection, and then Jesus rose from the dead 2,000 years prior, so why isn't that the first resurrection? It doesn't matter. Re Revelation chapter 20 says this is the first resurrection. It's like the first big official resurrection that everybody's been looking forward to, everybody, every saint anyway. And uh, those who are part of this resurrection are called blessed and holy, according to Revelation chapter 20, Verse 4. I suppose I should probably read this. I want to try to get through these notes. Like I said, I'm trying to go shorter on these lessons, but at the same time, I don't want to pass over stuff and just have you take my word for it. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 and 5. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. A bunch of beheaded people are living. All right? And they're reigning. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. All right? So... The Bible says the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. All right. So seeing as how the Bible calls this event, the return of Christ, the first resurrection, it implies that there's going to be a second resurrection. All right. If there's a first, then it implies there's going to be at least one more after it. And there is. And there is another resurrection. And this resurrection is a resurrection at the day of God. There's going to be a resurrection here as well. And the universe, as we know, uh, blows apart at the day of God. And the Bible says in Revelation 20, 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Well, how did they get there? How did the dead, small and great, get before God? Well, they're resurrected. They're resurrected. Death and hell gave up the dead which were in them, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, right? And they all stand before God. It's a resurrection. But the ones involved in this resurrection, the second resurrection, if you will, are not necessarily blessed and holy. As a matter of fact, Jesus said that for many, that resurrection would be the resurrection of damnation. All right? If you look at John chapter 5, John chapter 5, John chapter 5 and verse 28, the Bible says, marvel not, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in, which, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. That wasn't the case here. Here, there's, the only indication of anybody raising from the dead are those are, are saints, those that uh, were right with God in their lives, not, not church Christians. Those people were all resurrected here. Anybody that hasn't been resurrected that's a saint gets their body resurrected here. And, uh, and many are resurrected. But here, all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Okay? And it says uh, in verse 29, And shall come forth, and they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of of damnation. And at that point, they're cast into the lake of fire, those that are uh, the enemies of God. All right, so at this resurrection, it's Christians only. At this resurrection, it's uh, the righteous only. And at this resurrection, it's essentially everyone else. Okay. 
Now, let me just pause here for just a moment and point something out that may or may not be obvious to you. Okay? As you can see, there are similarities and there are some differences between these three days. There's a pattern that's emerging, but these three days are very definitely different events. Okay? And it should be clear to you that if you mix up or if you overlap these three events, and you try to say in your Bible reading, oh, well, the day of God, the day of the Lord, and the day of Christ are all referring to the same thing. They're all referring to the same event. If you try to do that, you're going to get all messed up and spun around in your understanding of Bible prophecy, and you're going to have wrong doctrine. So let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, listener. Do you agree that these are three separate events at three separate times. And would you agree that these three separate events all involve generally three separate groupings of people? Okay? Three separate groups of people. Now, if you answered yes, congratulations, you're a dispensationalist. <laughs> you might be a dispensationalist and you didn't even know it. As I've said before, the word dispensations is not necessarily the best word to describe the, to describe the differences in time periods. Especially the way the word dispensations is used in the Bible. It's, we use it a different way than the way it's used in the Bible. Dispensations in the Bible is literally a dispensing of something. But we use it in terms of time periods or, or, or divisions in, in, uh, along the timeline. Okay? Uh, since, that's, since the way we use the word dispensation is the way everybody's familiar with it, I'll just run with it. It's fine. Whatever. But dispensationalism, I just want to point this out, dispensationalism is not some heretical doctrine advanced by a rogue sect of Christianity. Uh, dispensationalism is simply a term. It's simply a term that people use to describe right and proper division of Scripture, especially when it comes to events on the timeline of history. Okay? If you divide events and groupings of people along the prophetic timeline, you are essentially a dispensationalist. Whether you like that term or not, whether you like that, that uh, whether you want to be associated with that or not, if you divide events and groupings of people along a timeline, you're, you're a dispensationalist, okay? Now, some Christians do indeed uh, go way overboard with their divisions, and that's a problem that can result in wrong doctrine, too. And so, with as with practically everything in the world, there's a proper balance, especially when it comes to this concept of dispensations, okay? Having no dispensations, and you don't divide anything... And you basically make the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, and the day of God all the same thing, having no dispensations is a problem, and you're going to end up with wrong doctrine. But the people that have too many dispensations, and they try to chop up everything and make a divisions you know, all throughout the timeline like crazy, they're going to have wrong, they have the wrong doctrine too. They get a lot of things messed up too. So nevertheless, these basic clear divisions... As I'm showing you here, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, the day of God, divided by the Great Tribulation here, divided by the Millennium here. You see that? That is essentially dispensations. We should recognize that. If you want to call it dispensations or dispensationalism, fine. If you want to call it something else, fine. If you want to call it simply rightly dividing, fine. Okay? But it's just a matter, it's just, you have to grow up a little bit and understand that you might not like the, the term or the title or being called a dispensationalist, but that's, that's basically what it is. And that's all it is. It's not some big heresy, okay? So you might have, uh, you, like I said, you might be a dispensationalist and not even know it, <laughs> okay? So the next thing I want to show you is uh, judgment, judgment. Uh, the day of Christ, we, we've seen last week, is going to be followed by the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment, the day of God, also has a judgment associated with it. And this judgment is what 
it, we don't really have a title for it other than the judgment of the sheep and goat nations, if you will, the sheep and the goats, okay? And uh, you have that judgment described in Matthew chapter 25. Jesus Christ is down on the ground. He's sitting on the throne of his glory. And, he's, and the nations are brought before him. And he judges the people, basically the survivors of the great tribulation. The people that survive and get through the end, uh, they're judged on how they treated the Jew. And you have that in Matthew chapter 25. This is called uh, the multitudes and the valley of decision in Joel chapter 3 or the valley of Jehoshaphat. Joel chapter 3, a judgment takes place there. Uh, also, you read about it in Daniel chapter 7, that whole thing about the ancient of days, that's referring to this judgment with Jesus Christ judging the nations, and the one like unto Son of Man there is David. That's another study for another time. Uh, and then you have another judgment here, obviously, we've looked at this already, but we have the great white throne judgment. So again, I want to point out that you have the judgment, judgment, judgment. Judgment of Christians, judgment of the nations, judgment of the universe, essentially right there, or everyone else. Okay, So we've hit a few of these obvious similarities, and I did that, like I said, so that you could see a pattern and uh, that God is weaving for us with these three great days of prophecy. Now we're going to start treading into some of the deeper waters, if you will, and uh, some of the places where the pattern is not going to be quite so obvious. Okay? We might get two of the three, but we might not get the third one. And essentially, if we remember that the pattern has been established, the pattern is there, we can perhaps get some light on some other things that are not necessarily spelled out in the Bible. Now, of course, we... Uh, I acknowledge that some of this is going to be speculation, but uh, we do have some hints to some of these things in the Bible, and so some areas might be sheer speculation, some might be fairly educated guesses, uh, but I'll let you be the determiner of that. But it is interesting, and so we're going to take a look at this pattern and see what we can find. All right, so there's one more that's still uh, fairly simple to see, um, and I'm going to say fire. The day of God has a lot to do with fire. The heavens and the earth explode, lots of fire. Fire comes down from God out of heaven, devours Satan and his armies. We know that the day of the Lord also has a lot to do with fire. The Bible says that Jesus Christ, when he comes back at this day, is going to be coming back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And uh, the Bible says in Zechariah chapter 14 verse 12, when Jesus Christ comes back, th describing the enemies of God, the armies of the Antichrist, it says, Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. So it's like a massive flamethrower just coming down, a nuclear blast, and just basically the people are standing there, the armies, and their flesh just blows off of them. <laughs> uh, that's crazy. That's amazing. And uh, it says, Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. Wow. The Bible says in the, uh, Psalms 37, verse 20, But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke, shall they consume away. That does not happen right here. <laughs> that happens right here. You cannot make the day of the Lord and the day of Christ the same thing. You're going to get really messed up if you do. The day of, when Jesus Christ comes back at the second advent, He destroys His enemies. He doesn't destroy anybody at the day of Christ. The church is taken out, and that's it. All right? So uh, what about, so we got fire, and we got fire. Now what about the day of Christ? I mean, is there any fire here? I mean, as I said, Jesus Christ doesn't show up from heaven and burn up a bunch of people at the day of Christ, at the rapture. Well, there actually is fire associated with this day, most definitely, the Bible says uh, the fire, though, is going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.13, the Bible says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day, in the context is the day of Christ, the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's works work of what sort it is. So it's kind of interesting, if you wanted to put it this way, you could say that the fire at this time uh, burns up the works of God. 
Because the, the, the universe, his creation, the things that God created, he burns up at that time. At this time, at the day of the Lord, the second advent, Jesus Christ burns up the work of Satan, essentially, if you will. The Antichrist, the world system is destroyed. The image of Daniel 2, that uh, image of all the nations, the stone falls out of heaven, smites it on the feet and blows the thing to smithereens. The works of the devil are destroyed here. And then... Uh, uh, Physically, the works of the devil were destroyed spiritually at Calvary, but uh, the rest of the works, the physical works, the kingdom of Satan is destroyed here. Okay, So the works of God burned up here, the works of Satan burned up here, if you want to put it that way. The works of Christians are burned up here, at least tried in the fire, to see if they bring forth gold, silver, and precious stones. So that's another pattern. This one isn't really filling in a gap because we, that's pretty clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. However, let's look at one more. All right, turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, let's wrap it up. I'm at 40 minutes. I'm doing pretty good. John chapter 10. All right. Now, there's a couple places in the Bible where Jesus likens himself to a thief. The Bible says in Revelation 16 verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. So Jesus likens his coming to that of a thief. Now, he doesn't liken himself to a thief because he's a sinful criminal. I mean, stealing is wrong. Thieving is a thief is a is a is generally a bad person, right? So Jesus isn't compare isn't saying he's a criminal of some kind. Uh, it's just that some of the things that Jesus is going to do at his coming are thief like, if you will. All right. So what does a thief do exactly? What does a thief do? Well, John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus tells us what a thief does. John chapter 10, verse 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Alright, so the first time that Jesus came, he came to impart life and salvation. And in that verse, he contrasts himself from a thief. He says, the thief comes to do this, but I am come to do this, the opposite. He came to give life and salvation at his first coming. However, his second coming, Jesus himself says in Revelation 16, 15, I come as a thief. He likens himself, he says, next time I come, I'm going to be like a thief. The first time he was not like a thief, the second time he is like a thief. Okay? Uh, the second time he comes, he does some of the things that a thief would do. Matthew chapter 24, go ahead and look there, Matthew chapter 24 verse 23. Matthew 24, verse 23, Jesus says, But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. You see how he switched his, his, the Son of Man out with a thief? In such an hour as ye think not, the thief comes. In such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man comes. You see, he's likening himself to a thief there. Now, he said that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Now, let's consider these three things in relation to our three great days of prophecy. The day of Christ, we might say, is likened to him coming to steal. He steals, essentially, the Christians from off the earth, and he takes them to heaven. And that's going to be a lot of people stolen from off the earth. Now, let me just say real quickly, in Matthew chapter 24, I fully understand that Matthew 24 is talking about the Great Tribulation and has nothing to do whatsoever with the rapture of the church. As a matter of fact, as I've written in my book, The Time of the End, and if you've read that, you're familiar with, with what I'm about to say, there's another rapture, it's a conditional rapture, that takes place during the beginning of sorrows, roughly three to four years into the end times after the rapture, there's another conditional rapture of Jewish tribulation saints. This specifically is what he's referring to in Matthew 24, where he says, I come, I come as a thief, you know, and he's going to take some people off the earth. Some of those verses, Matthew, uh, Revelation 16, verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth, right? So there's a conditional rapture where they need to be watching for Jesus' return. And if they're watching, they get taken out up, and they get to join in on the marriage supper of the Lamb. They are guests at that marriage supper. And essentially the benefit of watching, of being a wise virgin, like he said in Matthew 25, the benefit of being taken out, like you read in uh, Song of Solomon chapter 5 and... Uh, 
oh, there's, I'm forgetting another one. Uh, but the benefit of being taken out is essentially they don't have to go through the great tribulation. They're going to be up in heaven while the, world, while the rest of everybody else, the foolish virgins that weren't watching, have to go through the great tribulation. This specifically is where he likens himself to the thief. And this is not necessarily the day of Christ per se, although the marriage supper of the Lamb is going on up in heaven, so maybe you could say that's the day of Christ. But, but basically what I'm, talk, what I'm getting at here is this rapture and this rapture are, are similar in a lot of ways. Okay? They're not the same thing, but there's a lot of similarities there. And uh, he shows up in the sky, takes those people out, shows up in the sky, takes these people out. So I'm just going to go out on a limb and just say that the rapture is also likened to Jesus coming as a thief. Okay? I mean, what I'm getting at is technically those verses that talk about Jesus coming as a thief are right here, not here. But they're very similar. So I'm just going to say, day of Christ, thief, steal. <laughs> okay. I know that's a long explanation for something that's probably overkill, but some of you that are, that are wondering about that, I know, I know, at least if I was watching my video, I'd be wondering about that. So I had to point it out. Okay. So uh, he comes as a thief. All right. The day of the Lord. He, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill. All right. Thief. Thief. The second advent, this day of the Lord, Jesus Christ comes as a thief in the sense to kill. When he comes at the, at the second advent, he kills his enemies. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, it's the day of the Lord is likened, likened to a thief in the night. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief. Except when he comes at this time, he's not stealing. When he comes at this time, he's killing. And as a matter of fact, there's going to be so much killing at the second advent, at the Battle of Armageddon, that the Bible says that the, there's a stream of blood and corpses that's going to stretch for 200 miles. And that's Revelation chapter 14, verse 20. That's a lot of death. That's a lot of bloodshed. All right? Killing. Thief, thief. Steal, kill. So now, can we fill in the pattern? Is it possible that this day is also likened to a thief? Now, there's nothing in the Bible that says the day of God is likened to a thief. This is what I mean about filling in the pattern. There's a gap there. This is likened to a thief. This is likened to a thief, specifically. But this day is never likened to a thief. There's no verse in the Bible that says the day of God is like a thief because of this. However... We see this pattern repeating, so we're going to take an educated guess and ask, is it possible that this day is also like a thief? If the day of Christ is likened to a thief that steals, and the day of the Lord is likened to a thief that kills, well, what does that leave you with? Well, you're, le you're left with the thief that does one more thing. He destroys. Because the thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to fill in the gap destroy is the day of god associated with destruction you better believe it <laughs> the entire universe is destroyed at the day of god so it's kind of interesting that's what i mean is when you when you understand the pattern sometimes you get two things and you can fill in the third because you understand that there's a, a repeating pattern taking place so uh basically i'm gonna wrap it up there we're out of time for today. I'm going to wrap it up there. And next week, we're going to go into uh, some of the, like I said, we're going to continue this pattern. But I'm going to start showing you where the holes are. And we're going to do a whole lot more um, not uh, speculation. I don't want to put it quite that way because we're not just taking random shots in the dark. But I'm going to start showing you a couple of these places where the, the, the pattern has holes. And we're going to start trying to fill in the holes and see if we can learn some things about Bible prophecy that maybe aren't necessarily spelled out, but once you see the pattern and once, you, once we fill in the hole with the pattern, there's going to be some things that you're going to realize, oh, that actually makes a lot of sense and that's going to help you understand your Bible in a lot of ways. So uh, I think you'll be, uh, enjoy that. I think that'll be a blessing to you. I hope this lesson was a blessing to you. And like I said, if uh, you need to go back and watch it again, you can do that. I know this is a lot of new information for some of you. Uh, some of you, 
know all this already and you just take this for granted, but I know there's others that haven't heard this before, so you might have to watch this again. And like I said, if this is a blessing to you and you think it'll be a blessing to others, why don't you share the video with somebody else? And uh, God bless you. Thank, you. thank you for watching. Have a good week.